Hello! Welcome to Money Talks from Sleep Money. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios, and I have read a really great page-turning book called Private Equity, and the author is right here with me, Carrie Sun. Welcome. Thank you, Felix, for having me today. It's an honor to be speaking with you. (laughs) So welcome and introduce yourself. Who are you? I'm Carrie Sun, author of the memoir, Private Equity, as you just said, Felix. I was a quant. Uh, Then I worked at a couple large hedge funds. I quit the world of high finance a few years ago to get my MFA in creative writing. And now I'm a full-time writer out with my first book. The book is called Private Equity. It's great. We are going to talk about your time at the hedge fund. We're going to talk about the pursuit of money and what kind of people do it. We're going to talk about what happened to you, your your like long and varied career, talk about trauma. We're going to talk about capitalism. It's a kind of juicy conversation and it's all coming up on Slate Money. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Slate Money is sponsored this week by SAP Business AI. We've got some bad news. It won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. It will identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. It will automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. It's basically something that allows you to get ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. So this is a memoir. This is a memoir about you working for one of the more famous hedge funds out there, Tiger Global, and your time there not actually as a hedge fund manager or even a would-be hedge fund manager, but rather as the assistant to the hedge fund manager. As you say, you, you went to MIT, you were a quant. Explain to me how your career path kind of verged off the whole, you know, I'm going to become a master of the universe and, and make lots of money as a finance, as a hedge fund manager and into the whole, you know, assistance track. The origins of my interest in finance are complex. I grew up with very few means. My parents were graduate students from China and they were working odd jobs in mid Michigan while I was growing up. And it was a struggle to get by. And so from a very early age, I was very interested in how money could solve my family's problems. And I went to MIT, I double majored in math and finance, also minored in economics. I graduated in three years, and I immediately started working in quantitative equities. And then after working, I was at Fidelity Investments for about four and a half years, I discovered I had less interest in in making money than I thought I would. And I was way more interested in the people working there, the stories. And I decided I I needed to give myself the time to explore a pivot and, and a change in career. On my way out of finance, a recruiter reached out to me with this wonderful opportunity to work as the right hand person to a hedge fund manager. And at that time, I was very interested in getting my MFA already. Uh, I was very upfront with him during my interviews. And I thought this would be my day job. My day job would be working as the right hand person to a hedge fund manager while in my free time that I thought I was going to have do an evening MFA. So if I am getting this right, basically, you were worried that an actual job 
as a hedge fund manager would be too all encompassing, but that this job, because it was just a, just an assistant job, would be less all encompassing and would therefore give you some more free time to do sort of non financial stuff on the side. Is that it? That is correct. At the start of my job, even before I took it, my boss at the time, his conception of himself was that he was this easygoing, breezy, relaxed manager who was not super demanding. Spoiler alert. (laughs) (laughs) It is probably, I'm just going to say, impossible to find a billionaire hedge fund manager who is an easygoing, breezy guy. But insofar as such people exist, this, this guy wasn't one of them. And in fact, he seems to have been obsessed with running like a ludicrously tight ship. And despite having like an insane number of billions of dollars under management, having a really small headcount and working everyone incredibly hard. That's right. I think part of the working culture that he had instituted there was just an extreme lean staffing that it was no fat, no flesh, just bone level staffing is how how I felt. So what would be the reason? Why do you think that your hedge fund in particular was so obsessed with keeping things lean and making someone like you do a job that in any rational world would be done by like four or five different people? I think the fund I was at was so, so focused on Returns, 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 performance, 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 to the point where, you know, my boss didn't want to hear about any human dramas, any HR issues. There were, there was not HR. So there were, you know, he just assumed there would not be HR issues. If, if you don't have an HR department, then ipso facto, you can't have an HR department problem. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not sure I follow the logic here, or I'm not sure whether there's logic here. What is it about being understaffed that, increases returns if he wants nothing more than to maximize returns why would he want to be understood that is a great question and i will put forth my answer which is that i think he might disagree with you i think he thinks he is sufficiently staffed because i think he thinks that anything not you know focused on returns and performance is just not worth it i think that what we're really coming up here uh, against is these hedge fund billionaires and their conceptions of themselves. This fund in particular uh, just had an extremely lean idea of themselves. And, you know, I think my, my boss at the time, he had really no idea of how much work goes behind the work for the, his entire life. You know, he's been privileged from, from every step from, Montessori to where he is today. Um, he just doesn't know all the tiny details and administrative, operational, like just all this work that goes behind producing what he sees as the finished product. So anyone coming to him, whether it be analysts or me, I was his one assistant, anything that got to him had to be absolutely perfect. And I, I think he just thinks that ha- happens automatically. We have to take a break, but we'll be back after this. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Progressive Insurance. Right now you're listening to this podcast, but you're probably also driving or cleaning or exercising or grocery shopping. In any case, whatever you're doing, so long as you're not behind the wheel of a moving vehicle, you could be getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year. You'll be protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. 
Potential savings will vary. Discount not available in all states and situations. Slate Money is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is a new year still in February, and it's the time when we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. Don't try and revolutionize how you are or who you are. Just build on your strengths. And one way to do that is therapy. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and you can make changes that really stick. Therapy can reveal important facets to your history and yourself that you might not have realized and can transform lives. It's happened to millions. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and if you don't like them, switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash slate money today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash slate money. Has, has he read the book? Have you been in touch with him about it? I, he's super, super busy. So I haven't heard from him. I don't think he's read the book. And I hope uh, were he to read the book, I feel that he would think that I portrayed both him and the industry in as generous and fair way as possible while showing all the difficulties I had with the working conditions there. I think I think that's right. I don't think there's anything in the book for him to get upset by. No, nobody's perfect, but like by the standards of like rapacious hedge fund managers, he seems like a relatively kind of generous guy. He's constantly throwing l- ludicrously expensive gifts at you and giving you high salaries and telling you how good you are at your job and you know this kind of thing. And he's your job isn't easy, and eventually you give it up and achieve you know, a measure of happiness in life that you didn't have in the job. But I don't I don't think that he comes off badly. I don't think the fund comes off that badly. And and I guess that's one of my questions, given that, given that the fund doesn't come off so badly, like in what way is this an indictment of hedge funds and capitalism? I think fundamentally I'm kind of trying to subvert um the you know, there's a there's a common trope of the horrible boss who yells and throws things and, you know, bullies their employees. There's there's also this idea of Wall Street as as being, you know, full of partying and sex and drugs and alcohol, um, you know, and I wanted to take a close, hard look at what kind of this unsexy, mundane day to day work is like. And for me, I mean, the problem is that if you strip away, you know, all the glamour and all the, all the perks and all the money, there is just fundamentally this big power imbalance between employees and their bosses and employers. And when I told my boss about my burnout, he dismissed it and he didn't really believe me. And, you know, he, he told me I looked great, but beside that, which I felt like he was invalidating um, everything I was telling him about how I was feeling overwhelmed, he just couldn't accept that I was burnt out. Later, he told me that after upon reflection, um, you know, this was several months after I had left, uh, that 90% of it, of my problem with my job, the setup was due to my personal relationship at the time. So he he kind of <laughs> doesn't take any responsibility for my feeling completely, totally burnt out. So that's that's an interesting subplot in the book. You have this mostly off again, but occasionally on again relationship with a very rich boyfriend. And there's at one point there's a marriage proposal and a quite explicit sort of rider to that proposal which is like if you say yes and marry me then you will be fabulously wealthy and worth hundreds of millions of dollars and 
you will achieve everything that people on Wall Street want, which is first and foremost to get rich. Tell me, like, did you want to get rich? Like, is that why you went into finance? At what point did you decide you did not want to get rich? Was it one of those things where, like, you wanted to get rich just by working rather than by marrying? Or was that the point at which you started feeling that money was not actually what you wanted after all? So because I, because we really did not have much growing up, I equated money with freedom and stability. But after working at Fidelity Investments, you know, I, this was in 2006, I graduated, I was making six figures right after graduation, quickly making a lot more than that. I soon realized that money was more than anything I felt like golden handcuffs, and it, it was a trap. And so when I had met my boyfriend in the book, we he had just quit his hedge fund job. He was also trying to change careers. And he was debating whether or not to go to business school. I, I was really shocked that I could be having this conversation with someone who felt like we're wrestling with the same questions and figuring out how to lead the world of finance. And ultimately, over the course of many years, he, he decides to go back into finance and I decided to leave. And so our relationship just was no longer because he also uh, not only gave me an ultimatum, but I felt used money as a way of control. And so there was no amount of money I, re- I realized that anyone could give me both in, in my personal life um, with my boyfriend, nor at work. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure my boss at the fun I was at would have given me at one point, you know, for, for my birthday, actually, before I even asked him a question, he said, whatever you want, the answer is yes. So I, I think he was trying to be really generous. He would have given me anything, but I just realized that more and more the compensation, both in terms of actual dollar terms, but also the perks, the gifts, the luxury vacations and the spa days, I felt like it was a, it was a trap and it, it was a means of control. And is that the lesson you draw from the whole thing? Is that is that the message of the book that money sort of winds up controlling us and that like if we pursue it, like we end up in in deeply sort of fucked up places and that we have to kind of free ourselves from its malign influence? I think my main message in the book is not necessarily that money is always good or always bad, but that what drives us toward money, which is, which is often a very personal consideration. You know, I come from an immigrant background. I'm also a woman and a Chinese American. What drives us toward our considerations of career uh, and money? I think there might be room to challenge the capitalist logic of whether we actually need all the money to feel as secure as we do, both in terms of our identity and also our career. And I I don't really fault anyone for making decisions because they need to support themselves, support their family, or just feel good about who they are. But I want uh, my book to offer a framework for readers to project their own, whether hopes or dreams, but also insecurities about money and question whether they are in the right situation for themselves. And I think my, I'm, I'm hoping to raise those questions with my book rather than offer any prescriptive answer on whether money is good or bad. Quick break and we'll be straight back. Your pet is one of a kind, and so is their journey. While every playful moment is a memory in the making, sometimes cats and dogs are a little too good at getting into trouble. That's why you should check out ASPCA Pet Health Insurance. The ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Program offers customizable, 
accident and illness plans, making it easier for pet parents like you to help your pet get the care they may need. The ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Program has been around for over 18 years, and they've helped more than 600,000 pets during that time. They allow you to customize your plan, helping ensure that your pet's plan is as unique as they are. Because vet bills can really add up, especially when you're least expecting it. It's simple. Use their app to submit a claim and you'll receive reimbursement for eligible vet bills directly into your bank account. To explore coverage, visit ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash slate money. That's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash slate money. Again, that's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash slate money. This is a paid advertisement. Insurance is underwritten by either Independence American Insurance Company or United States Fire Insurance Company and produced by PTZ Insurance Agency Limited. The ASPCA is not an insurer and is not engaged in the business of insurance. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Hims. You probably have a checklist of things you need to have before you go out, your phone, your wallet, your keys. How does your hair look? Is my hair even there? If your hair is thinning, you might not be so confident even leaving the house in the first place. And that is why you need to check out Hims. Hims is changing men's healthcare by providing simple and convenient access to science-backed treatments for erectile dysfunction, hair loss, weight loss, you name it. The entire process is 100% online so you can improve your health fast with an array of high-quality options, including pills or chews for ED and serums, sprays, or oral options for hair loss. Once it's prescribed to you, your medication ships directly to you for free in discreet packaging, no waiting rooms, no pharmacy visits, no insurance needed. Pay one low price for your treatments, online visits, ongoing shipments, everything. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash money. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash money for your personalized treatment options. Hymns.com slash money. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See hymns.com slash money for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. This show is brought to you by Discover. You know, in today's world, it seems the best treatment is reserved only for a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service, as well as $0 fraud liability, which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. One of my other favorite hedge fund books, it's not really a hedge fund, but it's definitely a big fund, is Mary Charles's book about PIMCO, the, the Bond King. Uh, and, and PIMCO is also famously an incredibly hardworking place where no one has any kind of semblance of work-life balance. Everyone works incredibly hard and it's incredibly stressful. And there's this line in the book where where people would just you know people at pimco would hang out and would kind of jokingly but not so jokingly turn to each other and say like so why do you work at pimco and who hurt you as a child <laughs> it's just like that the, the, the only people who can put up with this are, are like sort of deeply fucked up people do you now that you're like happily ensconced in your world of being a full-time writer do you increasingly find yourself having being able to look at finance and Wall Street at a greater distance and go like, yeah, those people are not normal? I think that many people working in Wall Street are there for something beyond money. And obviously money the allure of money cannot be discounted. I I, you know, it it is this line is my book in my book about my boss saying, you know, um, the only reason anyone here is because of money. But I think what keeps people at a place in which there is this unrelenting and punishing intensity to the work is is often something deeper and more personal. And I think that that can be different for everybody. And for me, Felix, just to use your terms, like I, I had a very, very, very difficult childhood and I had a difficult relationship with both of my parents. I 
don't like to use the word trauma lightly, but you know, it, it is a term that my therapist uses um, to describe the way that uh, I was brought up. And I think, at least in my story, intergenerational, intergenerational trauma was definitely uh, a part of it because my parents had survived the Cultural Revolution in China. And we came over right during the Tiananmen Square protests. Um, so it was a very, very traumatic time for both my parents. I also had a traumatic time in, very early in college. And the reason why I tell some of my personal story in the book is precisely what you're saying about like why people continue to work in, in finance for these big paychecks. I think the systems of trauma and capitalism often feed on alienation. They feed on people, subjects, workers who are might be divorced from either their own labor or what they want for uh, any reason. And then inside the capitalist philosophy, the, those who are in charge and have power tend to dominate and ex- exploit those social relations. And I, so I, I do think that people who work in finance tend to have something else that they avoid that they might be trying to fill. You know, they might be working 10 years, 20 years trying to fill that void and ultimately be unable to f- fill it. And so I'm just hoping that with my book, it might cause some people to question, you know, it is what they're doing, is the path they're on something that they are choosing to want on their own volition and how much of it is influenced by their parents, their past, society, patriarchy, and then make a decision, make a meaningful determination for that for themselves. One of the um, tropes of the memoir format, especially memoirs where you're looking back on a traumatic, a difficult part of your life, is this idea that like, oh, yeah, you know, I was in a kind of fucked up place right then. And I'm better now. Now that you've been out of finance for a few years, and you've become this full time writer, is it was it that easy? Like, you just quit your job and then go get your MFA and your life magically falls into place when you don't have that terrible uh, Wall Street life surrounding you 24 seven, or are you still, you know, the same person? It's just like, in a slightly different context. I think I am a completely changed person. And the change was, as they often say, gradual and then sudden. Um, My therapist would say I was right for the change. For me, I also wanted to kind of challenge or subvert the typical, as you were mentioning, Felix, the a memoir trope of, you know, overcoming obstacles and adversity. I started my book with, I mean, this was, I was self-delusional at the time, but I thought I had my life all together. I was going to work this wonderful job and, you know, I wasn't going to worry about money and, um, or, or even status and kind of have this day job and then be able to do my uh, creative endeavors outside of work. And obviously that just did not happen as I show in my book. Um, and I actually wanted, I wanted the structure of my book to be, I found myself at this place at this moment in time with the career, with the life I have now. And like, how did I get here? And so it was kind of unpacking my early childhood. And so a lot of it, was coming to realize the stories I told myself about myself and the world were just simply not true. And I think real personal change is definitely not linear and often really messy and really messy and ugly and uncomfortable for both um, the person going through it and then other people around them. And I am very thankful that I have had support in friends and also family. Um, And ultimately, it took me many, many years to 
arrive at a place where I don't immediately um, recoil or cringe at my former self, but rather look upon my former self with a softness and understanding that I hope we can give to everyone. Because I think it's really, it's really tough to be a person in the world, whether you are an assistant to a billionaire or a billionaire. As I detail in my book, my boss uh, at the time, I have never seen him relax for a split second. The fun could be doing super well and the fun could be doing not well. And he is the same level of high vigilance and on edge and worried about the world falling apart in the, the next market open. And then for fun, what he does is he goes like surfing in dangerous waves where he needs to be on high vil- vigilance yes, and always exactly. worried about something wiping him out. Yes, exactly. He's worried about wipe out <laughs> every second of every day. Yes. Carrie Sun, thanks so much for coming on Slate Money. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Felix, for having me. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Yay. Thank you to Jared Downing and Shana Roth for producing and Merritt Jacob here at the Slate Studios. And we will be back on Saturday with a regular Slate Money. Slate Money.